Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zach Zorro West, incoming president-elect of the Florida Bar Young Lawyers Division. Welcome to the Young Lawyers Division's CLE webinar series. Before I introduce the presenter for today's program, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items. Attending this program entitles you to one general and one ethics CLE credit. The CLE course code should be up on the screen before you right now, but if you don't see it, it will be emailed to you 15 minutes following the completion of today's program. To earn CLE credits, you must enter the CLE course code on your member profile on the Florida Bar website located at www.floridabar.org. Also, you may submit questions to the presenter at any time during this program by entering your question at the bottom of the screen. I am honored to introduce today's presenter, Florida Bar President Ray Abedin. President Abedin will present professionalism as a survival strategy in a changing environment. But this is not your typical professionalism talk. President Abedin is going to educate us on the rapidly changing marketplace in which we practice. It's important for our development that we understand how the issues and principles discussed today may impact our profession in the future. And if you're a young lawyer, pay close attention because these issues will likely affect us more than any other segment of the bar. Without further ado, I present to you Florida Bar President Ray Abedin. Thank you, Zach, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, before I start, I'll just pick up on what Zach said. I have enjoyed a 30-year uh, career as a lawyer, and I practice law today pretty much the same way that I practiced law 30 years ago when I started as a young lawyer. I do not believe, in fact, I am certain that young lawyers on this call will have the same opportunity or the same career trajectory that I or the lawyers of my age have had with respect to the similarity of how I practice law today versus how I practice law as a young lawyer. You all will face dramatic changes in the delivery of legal services, the definition of legal services, the manner in which you engage your consumers, and I hope today to talk to you a little bit about and raise some questions for you how important professionalism is as a survival strategy in the changing environment. So that's what we're going to talk about today. No question now, professionalism and survival are intertwined concepts. Survival may sound like somewhat of a dramatic word, but we are, as you will see, no longer alone in our marketplace and we need to figure out how we fit, where we fit, or how we're going to survive in a changing marketplace. Certainly, by review, the ethics rules are how we must behave. We all know that, and we have very rigid, strict ethics rules that guide our conduct. Professionalism is how we should behave, and how we should behave how we treat each other, how we treat our clients um, is going to have a dramatic impact on what we do for our clients in addition to our ethics rules. I often ask audiences when we get to this part of the presentation, what is our professional identity? What does it mean to be a lawyer? What do you do as a lawyer? And I get blank stares, whether the audience is five people or 500 people. We lawyers have never really had to confront the issue of what does it mean to be a lawyer? So here are some of my thoughts, and I ask you to think about it. What do we do as a lawyer? We have independent judgment. We pro have professional distance from our clients. We understand and study the concepts of common good, the justice system, the rule of law. Service is a, a tenant of our professional obligation. Individual rights, think about civil rights, 
women's rights, freedom of speech, LGBT rights, all of those concepts are constitutionally derived, argued, and moved forward in the justice system by lawyers. We understand and have absolute loyalty to clients. We are one of the few professions that keeps confidentiality. In order for us to do our job, people have to tell us things that they tell nobody else. And we, we are guardians of secrets of many people. We have absolute integrity, honesty, and fairness, our principles of our ethics and our professionalism and our things we bring to the table. You're looking at a picture of a book that was very influential for me in my thinking, and I encourage you to read it. It's called The Relevant Lawyer. Really, it's about how to stay relevant as a lawyer in the new, changing, global marketplace. It's got articles, I think there are 20 chapters on all of the various subjects related to the practice of law and how to move and navigate in the changing marketplace. So why is all of this important? What's the point of all this as we go forward? Because professionalism is really now about survival. It's about how we differentiate ourselves in this marketplace using those tenets of our professional identity. So here's a young lawyer, and it used to be just him in the picture. But the new marketplace looks more like this. Competitors, non-lawyers, tech-based internet companies that are providing some form of legal service, in quotes, some form of relief, some form of solution to consumers on the internet. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, Ravel Law, it's a group of young lawyers out of Stanford who partnered with the School of Design and the School of Computer Science and are revolutionizing the way legal research is done by mining PACER. If you go on Ravel and you put in the name of a federal judge and you enter a natural language query, in less than a second you'll get a dashboard that will tell you how the judge has ruled on that particular issue to a percentage certainty. In the bottom right quarter you'll see Modria. Spend a minute and 49 seconds of your afternoon today on the Modria website and look at their Modria video. They call themselves the justice system of the Internet. That is an Internet-based tech platform that comes out of the eBay PayPal ecosystem to resolve disputes across borders, international, national disputes, small dollar value, but yet using the power of technology. Avo calls itself the largest legal marketplace in the world. You've all seen LegalZoom commercials. None of these companies have the same ethics or professionalism standards that we do. They're not regulated like we are. And the question is, now that we're not alone, what distinguishes us? How are we going to compete, work with, or stop these companies? This is a, just, I picked this up off the internet. Consumers, when they buy things, we, when we buy things, are using the internet more and more, and we are certainly looking for quick and easy. We're looking for price. We can compare price across an entire product line. We don't just have to go to the store in your neighborhood to find out what a pair of shoes costs or what a tie costs or what um, you know a car costs. We, as consumers, shop differently. Well, consumers are shopping for us differently, and providers are giving them alternatives that are cheap, quick, and easy. Always the question is, what do we do about this? So the new marketplace looks like this. Whatever can be commoditized will be. Whatever can be packaged will be. Whatever can be standardized will be. That is a will be. That is what is happening. It's already happened and it will continue to happen because the consumer is, is demanding these products be made as affordable and as convenient as they want it. 
Certainly lawyers are part of and will be part of and probably will never not be part of any new marketplace. The question is where do we fit with non-lawyers who are also providing services that are traditionally considered to be legal services to the new consumers and free is the operative word. Ravel Law the, has just bought the entire Harvard Law Library in what they call a free law initiative. And they hope to make the law free, give access to the law to the people that own it, which is every one of us and every one of our clients. LegalZoom purports to democratize the law, level the playing field, if you will, make the law affordable and accessible and convenient to consumers. So where do we play in this new marketplace? So the question is, what makes us different? Take a second. Take a second and pause and think as you're sitting at your desk watching this. What makes you as a lawyer different? I think it's our professionalism. I think it's our ethics. I think it's those things we talked about as part of our professional identity. Because we're not cheap, quick, or easy. Judgment can never be quick. It can never be easy, and it can never be quick. Analysis, strategy, the things we consider to be our value are not quick, quick, cheap, or easy. These are but a few things that I've come up with in thinking about what our value is now. Why would someone buy you or your services? What do you have to offer to a consumer who now shops in a different marketplace? I think these are our distinguishing characteristics of what we bring to our profession. The ultimate value is trust. We should become and are trusted advisors to our clients. And trust is very difficult to gain. It takes a long time. And it's very important to getting from point A to point B, getting our clients through the many difficult situations they encounter in their lives. And trust is a value that is particular to our profession, just like trust is a value in the medical profession. Or when you get on an airplane, I certainly hope you trust the pilot to make sure that she is doing all the right things to get you to your destination. The role as counselor has been lost. To be a counselor, your consumer, your client, your customer, your patient has to trust you. So we need to think about how we fit in the marketplace now, not as attorneys at law, but as counselors. We need to value our law degree because it's very easy to go on Google and get an answer to a question. The question is, is it the right question and is it the right answer or is there a better way? And if the consumer learns to trust us, if the consumer understands our value, we will be able to answer this question more appropriately. This is my business card, says attorney at law. We've lost that counseling concept. When I started as a young lawyer, the card said attorney and counselor at law. So I think we ought to think about the concept of going backwards, if you will, to how it used to be where attorneys were trusted advisors and counselors to our clients and market and project that to the marketplace as a distinguishing characteristic or a distinguishing component of us versus others. The new mindset should be think not like a lawyer, but think like a consumer. What does the consumer want? What does the consumer need? Just as in your personal life, particularly, I suspect, young lawyers, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all the other things my kids use, 
to communicate. Those are different ways of interacting. Facebook, which my kids laugh at me because they think it's creepy that an old guy's on Facebook. But the point is, we have to start thinking like consumers because we are consumers. We are consumers on the Internet, and we have to react to the people that are consuming our services in a different way and get them to understand that we need to think like a lawyer once we explain to them what that means. This is a picture of the Florida Bar Journal. It's the uh, journal two journals ago. It's all about technology. Talks in more detail about the impact of technology on our practice. I urge you to take a look at it. It's online at floridabar.org. And so as we go forward, we have to now think how we are going to differentiate ourselves, what it means to be a professional, and how important it is to stay relevant in the new marketplace. So I'll take questions now if you have any, but this is uh, essentially the end of the presentation. Thank you all very much. Zach? Yes. Yes, yeah, so everyone, if they have questions, can submit them through the box at the bottom um, or side of their screen, and they will be automatically directed to you, Mr. Abedin, um, so that you can respond to them accordingly. Okay. They're starting to come through now. So there's a question about LegalZoom. The question is uh, how we're different. As attorneys, we bear malpractice risks, so we act as quasi-insurers of our clients' transactions and claims, because if we don't do our jobs correctly, we can be sued. LegalZoom and the like don't stand behind their products and quotes, so people utilize these services at their own risk. That's true. But they seem to be utilizing LegalZoom and many, many other services at their own risk. Um, it's an issue that we, the bar, you, the bar, should deal with. Um, I know that LegalZoom, and I think, well, I know that LegalZoom requires the lawyers in their network to have malpractice insurance. Many bar associations don't require their lawyers, independent of LegalZoom, to have malpractice insurance. And so the issue of who's going to be responsible for transactions um, remains to be decided. However, the consumers are still going to LegalZoom, and they're still going to all of these other platforms in tens of millions of numbers. So um, I think I agree with your statement. Uh, how do you respond to an unethical request? I, I, I don't know, other than how we would always respond to an unethical request. Um, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the changing legal marketplace and recent initiatives to bridge the justice gap? I think they're intertwined. I, I think that, however, the gap is estimated to be 80% of the consumers who need legal services don't know they need them, can't afford them, uh, or don't use them. And so the justice gap is being filled by these other companies who are providing services to consumers that are typically considered to be legal services. The value estimated of the justice gap, in quotes, is about $45 billion. And so when you put $45 billion of potential um, profit or potential business in a big pile and ignore it, like our system has, uh, business comes into that, and business has been coming into that. The estimated amount of venture capital investment into the legal marketplace now exceeds $1 billion. Um, so it's dramatic, and the consumer is, of course, going where they can get an answer to a question. 
LegalZoom and Avo I know and so does Rocket Lawyer because I, I study those more and have more interaction with them. They provide free legal advice, answers to free legal questions, and I'm sure other providers do too. Um, and so the justice gap is being filled by non-lawyers and we're trying, we the lawyers, we the legal system are trying to figure out how to adapt to that. So do you believe the current rules restrict lawyers from participating and competing in today's legal marketplace? Um, the answer is yes, very much so. And we have got to have a discussion, we meaning each and every one of us and every, each and every one of you and your bar associations, wherever you're from, um, with the bar associations, the members of the Board of Governors, the president of your bar, and the Supreme Courts that ultimately govern our ethics and professionalism standards. Uh, because the rules that govern our practice now were written at a time when the Internet didn't exist, when the markets were different, when their geographical boundaries actually mattered, um, where consumers went to the lawyer down the street or in the neighborhood or in the same city um, and were able to get legal services. Um, now our advertising rules, for instance, severely restrict how we can advertise versus the non-lawyers are not regulated that way. Whether we can get venture capital money, non-lawyer money, uh, needs to be addressed because the competitors in the marketplace have unlimited, unfettered, unrestricted access to non-lawyer money to help build their businesses and build their brands. Um, because we cannot share fees with non-lawyers. It's something we have, to, we have to explore and we have to talk about because the consumers are going to these online, quote, non-lawyer, close quote, platforms, and they're, they're pooling over there. And our rules prohibit us from interacting with those non-lawyer-owned, Internet-based tech platforms that have all the consumers. And so if we want clients, we're going to have to deal with those rules at a minimum. At least discuss them so we can determine. We don't, we don't want to do it. We want to compete or we want to cooperate. Um, so what is the extent that various state bar associations pressed for laws addressing the pseudo practice of law? That's a very interesting question. And um, one that uh, LegalZoom has managed to uh, confront successfully. They just was a, there just was a consent settlement between LegalZoom and uh, the state of North Carolina where LegalZoom sued the state of North Carolina alleging that their rules were um, violative of the Constitution and uh, LegalZoom is now authorized to do its business in North Carolina and it's not considered to be the practice of law. The question is, what is the definition of the practice of law? In Florida, it's been very difficult to define that. We certainly know what the unauthorized practice of law is because we have said it's, it's everything that we don't want you to do and we criminalize it. It's everything we think is the practice of law. If you do it, um, it's criminal. So the reality is, what is the definition of the practice of law? What does it mean to be a lawyer? What is the giving of legal advice is now something we are confronting because the consumer wants things done that either we're not doing or we can't afford to do or, um, or, or just aren't getting done, frankly. So it's something that's yet again another issue that we bar associations, you and particularly the young lawyers, uh, are going to have to confront uh, because that definition is in play again on a massive sort of global borderless um, platform. Let's see. Let me see. So how do you feel about limited licensed legal technicians and similar individuals and how do you think they will affect the regular licensed attorneys? Um, that's a very good question. 
the state of Washington is the only uh, state that has limited license legal technicians. They're triple LTs is what they're called. And they fought, uh, the Supreme Court was the driver of that, and they fought with their bar association for 12 years. I think there's seven of them that have graduated. The issue is in the question, how does it affect lawyers? Um, and unfortunately, it's not about us anymore. Uh, it's never really been about us because it's always been about the public that we serve. But 80% um, of the folks that we're supposed to be serving need legal services. And triple LTs are one way of perhaps many, as are Internet platforms, as are forms, as are self-help forms, as are automated uh, alternative or uh, online dispute resolution platforms like Modria. There are now other alternatives for the consumer to get service or help. Um, and so triple LTs are allowed to make limited appearance in courts, the concept being some representation by someone who has some level of skill is better than no representation uh, and having people go alone. Um, certainly it's uh, in its initial phases, but the question is how do we as a bar association, how do we as lawyers discharge our ethical obligation to provide liberty and justice for all when 80% of the consumers aren't getting any represent, representation. Um, and so triple LTs is a solution, one of many, to that issue. Um, I've got a lot of questions, so give me a second so I can read through them. So here's a question. Many lawyers cannot compete with online companies in terms of price, not only because we want to eat, but because we have six-figure student loans, which is the, just a, a terrible reality of many, particularly young lawyers, uh, requiring a certain amount of income. Do you think it will ever be possible to compete in terms of price, as you discussed in the recent Bar Journal article, without first tracking these ever-increasing costs of legal education? So I don't know what to do about the cost of legal education, which is skyrocketed and increased faster than every other sector um, of the market uh, in the last 15 years. The, the, the issue of how to leverage technology and how to compete with online service providers um, is something that we need to discuss. The online service providers believe that their platforms can actually enhance a lawyer's income. That may be their marketing pitch, but that's what they're saying. If you use the tools and techniques that they've provided inside of their platforms, where right now you can't go because of the rules, you might be able to make a decent living. Um, they think so anyway. Uh, it certainly is, um, again, this is a lawyer-centric question, and it's a fair question because of the debt that young lawyers carry, uh, which is awful. Um, but I wonder if it's, it's not necessarily competing with them. Let them do what they do well at low prices. You couldn't make money doing it anyway. And we're not doing that now anyway. There's a ton of stuff in the legal, in quotes, marketplace, close quote, that we haven't done. That's why the consumers just haven't come to us, that are getting done cheap. And we don't want to be cheap. And we can't even afford to be cheap even on this question, because you can't make enough money to eat and pay your student loans. So it's recalibrating, rethinking what the definition of the practice of law is um, and, and being able to do that and make money in a new Internet marketplace where your consumers are going to be different. They're going to be in different places with different demands, um, with different options of not only delivery but of access. So this is a question that's interesting and I face every day. 
Many lawyers don't like change. How do you suggest dealing with organizations that are resistant to change? And so as president of the Florida Bar, I am the head of an institution that resists change. Any institution resists change. People don't like change. Lawyers, by nature, we are conservative. We look backwards to move forward. We are hesitant to make decisions unless we make sure we have everything read and every I dotted and every T crossed. So we, as other professions, are reluctant to change. The issue is the marketplace is not consulting us and is changing. And the consumer is not consulting us and going someplace else. Uber did not call the taxicab institutions and, and say, hey, we'd like to put our platform in your taxis because the taxi cab companies would have said no. Uber just went and did it and changed the paradigm. Uh, and so think about that. You know, Apple didn't call Kodak and say, we want to put cameras in these phones because everybody would have said it's stupid to put a camera in a phone. In fact, many years ago, I had a phone that didn't have a camera and it broke. And I went to buy a new phone, and they, they wanted to sell me a phone with a camera. And I said to the nice person on the other line, I don't need a phone with a camera. I have a camera to take pictures, and I have a phone to make phone calls, and I don't want it. And she said, sir, it's not available. They forced me to change. Of course, now I don't have a camera anymore, and I don't even think about using my phone to take pictures all day, every day, and neither do you. The question then becomes, what are you going to do? And the importance of these talks and the number of you that are here, you have got to ask your bar organization, the Florida Bar, for those of you from Florida or wherever you're from, we, are, we work for you. I am your president. The Board of Governors is your Board of Governors. The Supreme Court regulates the bar in every state, and we as lawyers, as individual lawyers, need to, it needs to bubble up is the example I use. The bubbles need to start percolating. And you, and particularly the young lawyers, need to address the older lawyers who are in positions of authority and can make change, but the reality of this changing marketplace and how we need to adapt so you all can have the successful careers that you've worked hard for and so you can have the benefit of a professional career and, and do what you love doing, which is being a lawyer. What is the Florida Bar doing to help lawyers compete in the new marketplace? Well, we're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, there is currently, for those of you in Florida, uh, going to be a very robust discussion on modification of the lawyer referral service rules an attempt to figure out how, if at all, Florida lawyers can work with companies, non-lawyers, that have pools of consumers and how that interface is going to work. What you can do is pay close attention to that debate and engage in that debate. Pay close attention to the debate and engage in the debate. Um, that's the bubbling up. You know, do you think you should be able to go to X company uh, and, and work with them and pay them some sort of fee of some form or the other for access to their clients, to their, to their customers, your clients, because that's the way the markets are working. Um, we are trying to have a discussion on advertising rules. We are trying to figure out how best to position Florida lawyers to work in a global marketplace. Um, you know, eBay, I was talking to the guy who founded Modria the other day, and he was at the beginning of the eBay uh, revolution or the eBay evolution. And the concept for them is, where is the law in an eBay transaction? So, you know, question to the audience. Think about that. If I buy a watch from a guy in China today when I finish this call, What's the jurisdiction? What rule of law applies to that transaction? What do I do if, if it's the wrong watch? What does the guy in China do if I don't pay him? What if there's a defect in shipping? How does all that work? Because 
not only is it different countries, different, completely different sets of law, who's, where are we going to do it? How are we going to resolve any of those disputes? Because we're, the world is getting flatter, because of the interconnectivity that the Internet provides us, the benefits of that are we get to buy stuff from a guy in China. The, the hard part of that for lawyers is how do we resolve a dispute? So we are having a conversation, talks like this with large numbers of folks like you, Hopefully, we'll leave you with lots of questions. Hopefully, we'll get you to engage in the bar because I believe you don't have a choice not to engage. You need to really be engaged with us, paying attention to what is going on and the rules because the rules right now make it very difficult for you to compete with the marketplace. Give me a second while I look at another question. Which state bars do you feel are ahead of the curve in addressing the changing legal marketplace and why? Uh, I just got back from the ABA Tech Show in Chicago where they pool all of the tech knowledge in the legal marketplace. And um, Florida is considered, along with Washington State, to be a thought leader in the changing marketplace because we're asking the hard questions. We are, we are engaging our membership and bringing presentations like this to our membership. We are stating the obvious, which is a hard statement to make. Folks, we're not alone in the marketplace. We've got to figure out why we're different and how to apply what we're different and then how to work in a marketplace that's different. This isn't lawyer to lawyer anymore. That's why that picture of that young lawyer sits there and he's by himself and then all of a sudden it gets crowded and you saw it didn't get crowded with other lawyers. It got crowded with other companies, non-lawyers that are sucking up the consumer and providing some form of service. Now, some of those companies hook up with lawyers, and they have lawyers that provide legal advice when and if necessary. Um, and so that's really Florida, I'm proud to say, is uh, considered a thought leader in this issue um, of the changing marketplace. Uh, and Washington State, because they've been so radical with the triple LTs and other issues. Do you believe that it is a net positive that there are more legal-related resources on the Internet now? The short answer there is yes, from the perspective of the consumer. Uh, Civics 101, the Constitution says we the people. The government is owned by the people. The judicial system is owned by the people. And I remember when I first started thinking about this, being just shocked that 80% of the people don't use the legal system, um, have difficulty using the legal system, don't understand how it works, don't understand that they need a lawyer. And the Internet-based platforms have taken that and they said to the consumer, we're going to make it easy. Come to our site. I mean, you know, go to LegalZoom or go to Avvo or go to Rocket Lawyer. Go on their sites. Go look and see what the competition is doing. You'll see on those sites that it says, you have a question, we'll give you an answer. We'll give you a lawyer for free. We'll give you, a, you know, Q&A on Avvo is millions of questions for free. And they bring the consumer in. And then the consumer will say, okay, well, since you answered this question for free, how about another answer? And they go, well, we can't do that. We'll give you to another lawyer. That's what we're dealing with. Um, and so from the consumer standpoint, they are entitled, we are entitled by Constitution. That's our democratic process, really, isn't it? That, that we apply the law and they have access to the law. And when 80% don't have access, that's troubling. Let's see. 
Are there any other professions such as the medical profession that are going through a similar changing marketplace? And is the bar looking at how other professions are adapting to the new marketplace? The answer is yes. Uh, we are the last ones of the professional group to go through a change in the marketplace. We, we because of the complexity of what we do, and it's not more complex than medicine or engineering or architecture, very different, but those systems, those professional systems have already gone through transformation. Um, certainly when you go to the doctor, I hope you don't have to, but when I go to the doctor, I don't see the doctor first anymore ever. I see a nurse or I see a paraprofessional. Um, the doctor does a very limited uh, exam once she figures out what's wrong and her team figures out what's wrong. And there has been a move towards specialization. In the field of architecture, there are open source now. And so um, you can get architectural plans and design plans on the Internet for free. So, you, so can you with some engineering plans for free on an open source platform. So the question is, what value do you need an engineer for? You can go on WebMD and get the answers to many medical questions. And some are simple and you can answer them. The role of the doctor is, why do you need to go to the doctor? Why do you need to go to the lawyer? Why do you need an architect? Why do you need an engineer? Well, because they provide a certain value, a certain comfort. You trust your doctor because you can look her right in the eye and she's looking you right in the eye and says, this is what you need to do. Um, but a lot of what doctors do or engineers do or architects do or, frankly, lawyers do, we can't afford to do it. We're not doing it. We don't want to do it. So other people are doing it, and um, it's happened in every other profession. Are we looking at other professions? You know, yes, but it's hard to talk to a lawyer about changing the way she practices law by pointing to doctors because that's just not um, – that's just not something that we do well. Uh, what is the future of the legal marketplace in Florida with regard to the changing marketplace and reciprocity? Well, we talked about that in the fall uh, of 2015. Uh, the bar voted against any form of multi-jurisdictional practice in any form. Um, the marketplace keeps changing. So um, the issue for those that will lead the bar in the future, the issues for young lawyers is where are you practicing law? Because the Internet, I don't need to tell you all, lives everywhere. And, and, and that's where the eBay model comes from. They buy and sell things everywhere, anytime, all day, every day. And the legal services marketplace is moving there. Um, you know, if you need a legal question answered and you go on, you know, XYZ platform, where is that? business taking place, and if that consumer from Montana needs an answer to the question, well, right now, a Florida lawyer couldn't answer that question because we've decided from a regulatory standpoint that in order to practice law in Florida, you need a Florida license, and then the rest of the 49 states have said basically, well, if you're going to practice here, you need a Montana license. So as the marketplace continues to change and the borders become less and less relevant, to some, some of the things that we do. Um, we're going to have to deal with where we can practice law or where we want to practice law because the consumers are going to go. The consumers don't understand jurisdictional issues. They don't understand border issues. They understand getting a, a, a solution to their problem. What does Triple LT stand for? Thank you, uh, Pamela, for an easy question. It's a limited license legal technician. Washington State. Go to the Washington State Bar and take a look at that. And, um, and you'll see uh, they're separately licensed. They can stand alone and have their own law and have their own firm, and they can make limited court appearances. Here's another question. Could swift adaptation to the changing legal marketplace undermine the careful professional and analytical reputations? that lawyers have spent so much time cultivating? Uh, the answer is yes. And the question for the lawyers is, what are we going to do about it? How are we, with limited 
advertising rules with no ability to get extra money from venture capital, how are we going to brand our profession to explain that to the consumer against, I mean, go look at a LegalZoom commercial. Uh, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, they're very attractive. You will see nothing of the sort from the bar, any bar, because we don't do that. We don't want to do that. Should we do that? Um, should, we, should we be in the marketplace talking about why you should get a lawyer and the benefits of getting a lawyer versus a form? Could we possibly say, sometimes a form's a good idea. Could we possibly say that? Sometimes a form's a good idea, but in most cases, or these are the cases, you really do need a lawyer. Don't bother with the form. Come to us. Again, that takes into account our regulatory scheme that was created at a time when it was thought that advertising in the yellow pages denigrated the profession. Um, you know, the big brouhaha about the yellow pages. I don't even know what the yellow pages are anymore. Maybe the young lawyers in the room here don't. I'm sure you do, but but when was the last time you went to the yellow pages for anything? Um, I, I certainly don't remember. So, um, you know, how would we set ourselves apart from the non-lawyer service providers? That's the questions asked in the presentation. We need to, but we need to market it, and we need to figure out how to market it against relatively strict advertising rules that don't let us and against companies that, that are in the business in the business of acquiring clients and marketing and branding where we are in the business of delivering legal services. My job as a lawyer every day is to practice law. And, and I didn't go to business school, neither did many of you. Presumably if we all went to the same type of law school, we were all taught the same way. And we didn't get courses on branding and marketing and uh, Internet platform technology and stuff like that. Um, and so, um, you know, we, 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 we are now competing with those types of services. So here's an interesting question. These services cannot provide legal advice. They say they don't. Uh, lawyers provide legal advice. That's true. The question is, what does legal advice mean now in the new marketplace? The, the, question, for, the question was written, lawyers provide legal advice as a statement. My response is, we need to consider what legal advice means. Consumers may be misled or just simply confused as to the service provided by these platforms. They may be, but they're going there in, in, in enormous numbers, and many of them not all, are getting the services that they need. Certainly the platforms aren't perfect. Lawyers aren't perfect either. Um, and so that to me is a question I get often. It's like, well, these platforms don't do a perfect job. They don't give, they don't give the right advice all the time, and you know, they mislead consumers. Well, I, I dare say, unfortunately, we suffer from the same on our end, hopefully not as much or hopefully not at all, but that's just not a reality. Does it make sense for us as lawyers and our organizations such as the bar to communicate the fact to consumers that these legal services are not providing legal advice? Sure, but we need a marketing campaign and we need advertising and we need the bar to do that for us. But where are we going to get the money? Our dues haven't been raised in 15 years and I would hate to raise dues on particularly young lawyers given the reality of being a young professional and the economic burden on, on the young lawyers because of their student loan debt. The question is, where does the money come from? And that's, a, that's to me, a critical factor in this new marketplace. Because if I were competing with Zach, then, you know, I'm a lawyer, standalone. Zach's a lawyer, standalone. And, you know, I might go to the bank and get a loan, and Zach will get a loan, and, you know, we'll, a we'll advertise in our neighborhood who's the better lawyer. But that's just me and Zach. Or, you know, you add a third lawyer or you add 50 lawyers or, you know, you see lawyers advertising a few now on billboards. The change that I think is so dramatic and hard to, to get your head around is these are now global national marketplaces that are funded with hundreds of millions of dollars and advertising budgets that we don't have. Uh, and it's something to think about. 
So, for example, if we wanted, if the bar said we want to now go on a marketing or advertising campaign, we'd have to raise the money to do that. The companies that are unregulated by the bar go get VC money, venture capital money. We we don't do that. Um, so I got a statement that the new yellow pages equals Google. Sure. And Google itself is unregulated. Um, and so the consumers, when they Google, need a lawyer. 17,400,000 uh, searches for legal forms in Florida alone, I think, in 2014. But when they go to Google and they need a lawyer, if I were to type in I need a divorce or I need a triple L, uh, I need a, an LLC or I need to get rid of my partner, my business partner, what shows up there are these companies that have the money and the know-how to put themselves high on the search engine list. Um, and again, that's what we're, uh, we're competing with. When a question is posted on Alvo, can that communication be considered privileged? Um, yeah, that's an issue that nobody's really talking about. Avo says they're not giving legal advice, um, that they're providing answers to legal questions. Figure that out. Um, and, you know, nobody's really educating the consumer on privilege. So that's a question we need to discuss and we need to have a dialogue, but we're not really as a system with the marketplace. Right now we are in a state of trying to grapple with the new marketplace. Many of the lawyers I talk to are completely unaware, completely unaware of the marketplace, anything other than their day-to-day -day practice, which is not unusual or abnormal because we're professionals and we're busy practicing law every day. We're worried about our our clients. We're worried about doing the best job we possibly can. We're worried about getting it right. We're worried about the deposition or the hearing or the closing tomorrow. Um, and, and we're trying to make a living. So now to say to lawyers, well, you've got to look up and disregard that for a minute and look at this new marketplace, which has all kinds of scary, giant things happening, is kind of hard to do, but it's something that we have to do. Let me see if I find... Uh, Another question. There's a question about debt forgiveness, and that's uh, been in the legislature. Uh, I don't think the bar really or the Supreme Court can do anything about debt forgiveness, but um, I believe the young lawyers have uh, have done some work in the legislature to uh, try and pass a bill on loan forgiveness or debt forgiveness. So I just got the signal from Zach that it's time to wrap up. Thank you all very much for listening, and uh, I, hope you, I hope you take uh, something from this presentation. It's important for America in the future to have good, solid, strong lawyers working in the system. And uh, I hope I hope I wish you all very a lot of success. Thank you. Thank you, President Abedin, for your presentation today. We really appreciate it. For those of you who are still on the call, uh, the CLE number is two two zero nine R. That's two two zero nine R, and that number will be emailed to you probably within the next fifteen minutes or so automatically. Thank you again for your participation today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.